Now, too often we tell a person to just believe. And I remember going to Cape Town, South Africa uh, years ago, and one of our hosts said, when I tell someone just believe without giving them reasons to believe, I'm asking them essentially to commit intellectual suicide. <laughs> Well, thank you for watching another episode of the Jew3 Project podcast. As always, I'm your host, Lisa Fields, the founder of the Jew3 Project. And I know we've been gone for a minute and it's been uh, sporadic with the planning of courageous conversations, but we're back on uh, our regularly scheduled program. Uh, and today we're bringing someone who was a part of courageous conversations um, with us. So uh, that was fun to meet him there for the first time in person. Um, so today, uh, without further ado, let's welcome our special guest, Dr. Luke Bobo. Welcome, Dr. Bobo. Well, thank you, Lisa. I'm glad to be here. And hello to your guests and your audience. Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, stepping up uh, to be uh, a panelist for the Courageous Conversations. Uh, I know I hit you the last in the, uh, in the fourth quarter, so I'm glad you were able to step in for us. Well, it was an honor. And when I received a text from Vince Bantu, I was, I thought he had the wrong uh, number, <laughs> but I was glad to join. It was such, such a stimulating and encouraging event just to be around uh, folks like us that, that think deeply about theological issues. So I was, I was indeed honored. Awesome. Awesome. Well, for those who weren't in Courageous Conversations or don't know who you are, just give them a little bit, bit of background. Okay. So I'm originally from uh, Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, that's where I live now. Uh, I'm married uh, 35 years to uh, Rita Holmes Bobo. We have uh, two grown kids. Brianna is 29. Caleb is 24. Uh, ironically, we lived in St. Louis for 25 years, and that's where our kids live at the moment. Um, I have a bachelor's in electrical engineering, a master's in electrical, electrical engineering, a, a master's of divinity, and a PhD in a weird area called rabbinic andragogy. Simply, it's the study of how adults learn um, in terms of how rabbis taught adults. And I studied a second century rabbi, Rabbi Akiva, and he's, um, he's a very fascinating fellow. Uh, currently, I work for an organization called Made to Flourish, and we are a pastor's network, and we help pastors connect Sunday faith to Monday work. Uh, too often in our culture, the pastor's job and the missionary's job is elevated as the most important, but we want to encourage uh, all workers regardless if they are a janitor to a CEO, their work matters in God's economy. So um, my role there is director of curriculum and resources, and I develop resources for pastors in our network, which is about 2,300 pastors across the country. And I also curate resources that are existing and recommend those uh, to our pastors as well. So that's a little bit about me. I've written Three books. Um, we plan to discuss one during this podcast. I wrote a book called Discipleship with Monday and Mon that is um, explains more about what it means to incorporate faith Monday through Friday. And I also wrote a small little book called Living Salty and Light Filled Lives in the Workplace. Um, and that's a mouthful. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm fascinated by this PhD. Where did you where did you get your PhD? I earned my PhD from the University of Missouri St. Louis, uh, better known as UMSL. Okay. And what made you want to get a PhD in in that? Well, it it's such a specific. It combined, <laughs> it combined my love for teaching adults, because andragogy is the corollary to the word pedagogy. Pedagogy is the art and science of helping kids learn. Andragogy is the art and science of helping adults learn. So it took my love for teaching adults and my love for the Old Testament, and it combined those two loves 
for uh, this project, this PhD dissertation. In fact, it was a, a rabbi who suggested I study Rabbi Akiva. Um, so that's why it ended up um, studying rab uh, rabbinic andragogy. Wow, that's, that's indeed fascinating. Um, <laughs> and I know you have a passion for apologetics. Um, can you uh, tell our audience a little bit about what makes you passionate about apologetics and what do you think the greatest apologetic need uh, that you see in culture today? Uh, that's a great question, Lisa. Um, I guess my love for apologetics actually begins almost 20 years ago. I just found myself gravitating toward uh, issues or narratives in our culture, uh, individualism, autonomy, um, what an atheist believes. In fact, I would cut out articles from newspapers and magazines related to contemporary culture, postmodernism, modernism. And it wasn't until I went to seminary that the light bulb went on and I discovered that I have a, I have a love for engaging unbelievers in issues that matter. And if, if you take an interest in what an unbeliever believes, that can be a good segue to sharing the gospel with them. And I, I, another thing, I, I think uh, too often we tell a person to just believe. And I remember going to Cape Town, South Africa uh, years ago, and one of our hosts said, when I tell someone just believe without giving them reasons to believe, I'm asking them essentially to commit intellectual suicide. Hmm. The Christian faith is a reasonable faith. It has reasons and as, as believers, we must be ready to give uh, reasons why we believe the gospel. And I, I suppose that's a good transition to what I see the greatest need is. And that is, I think too many Christians in general have adopted an anti-intellectualism. And perhaps that's because of the internet or Facebook, but I find so many Christians don't like to read. And one of the things I would emphasize to your listeners is to love reading and, and love reading a broad range of subjects. And I, I would guarantee you, if you are familiar with many things in culture, it will serve you well. Uh, just, just one example. So Chuck Colson was sharing the gospel with a unbeliever and this unbeliever thought he was speaking Greek because so many people, we could assume years ago that people had a basic understanding or basic vocabulary about Christianity, but not anymore. So he was ex trying to explain the gospel using Christianese. We all know what Christianese is. And he was not getting anywhere, but when he started using illustrations from Woody Allen movies, he was getting somewhere with this young man because this young man also had an interest in Woody Allen movies. So I, I think it's incumbent upon Christians to know uh, a lot or several things, not, not very deeply, but know a lot about many things because much like what happened to Chuck Colson, it can serve you well down the road, mm -hmm. if that makes sense at all. Yeah, uh, Ravi often says that illustrations are the uh, windows that let the light in. Yeah. Um, and I think that is um, kind of what you're sharing, that if we know how to connect um, Christ and culture, it kind of illuminates the gospel for people. Exactly. Um, Exactly. In a relevant, a relevant way. Um, so your book, what what made you want to write about write about uh, interpreting scripture? Well, for a couple of reasons, a couple of reasons why I wanted to write a lay person's guide to biblical interpretation. One. Lisa, I remember uh, like it was yesterday. A guy in my Sunday school class came up to me and he said to me in secret. He says, Luke, I don't know God like you know him. And so that's 
that's the first um, signpost that something was awry. Then secondly, I think so many people in the pews think the person standing up preaching is the professional Bible interpreter. So I wanted to demystify this process of biblical interpretation for the person who doesn't have the means or doesn't have the interest to go to seminary. So I wanted to bring what's typically done in seminary and taught at a very complex level. I wanted to make it accessible to the Sunday school teacher, the deacon, the church leader, or a person who just wants, wants to have a companion when he or she is going through the Bible. So for those reasons, I, I want my friend and others to know our God deeply. And one of the ways we know our, our God deeply is by Bible study. And secondly, I wanted to demystify this whole biblical interpretation enterprise, because again, too often people say that's a professional, that's for the professional, namely the person preaching or teaching. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important. And I, and I, I think it's important one because it is needed for the body of Christ because people think, you know, interpreting scripture has to be this complex thing only reserved for MDivs or people who went to seminary or Bible, Bible college. But number two, I think it's very important because you as an African-American male um, writing a, a layman's guide to interpretation is so helpful. Um, in a space where most uh, hermeneutics uh, books are are written by by white men, when we're dealing with a culture that is um, opposed um, in in a lot of ways to receiving uh, biblical interpretation methods from a white male because of uh, this whole concept of Christianity being a white man's religion. I think it's helpful to have a book written by a black male on interpretation to um to help flush that help flush that out for our culture. Um if that makes sense. Yeah it does. In fact uh I never thought of that, Lisa. Um in fact that's that's probably why I encourage too often in seminary um so when I went to seminary, I studied mostly uh, dead white gods. And many seminaries will say, well, we would love to offer more non-white resources, but um, there's a shortage of them. So that's why I encourage African-American uh, writers and scholars to, to write because we need, but we desperately need more to supplement what's on the shelves and these white, predominantly white seminaries. And, and so if, if there's anyone listening or will be listening to this podcast, I just encourage if you, if you have a propensity for writing to write, because we just need more books by non-white authors in this space. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, so when we, when we think about helping just the regular church goer um, be able to understand scripture, where do you start with it? So um, when I wrote this book, you know, <laughs> my background is engineering and uh, in engineering, engineering is notorious for uh, acronyms. So I wanted to create an acronym for the layperson for them to remember how to use this book or how to approach a biblical interpretation. So I came up with the acronym SCAR. S C A R. So the first thing I would encourage someone new to this whole biblical interpretation enterprise is, is just to sit. That's what the S stands for. Sit with the text and just read it and read it and read it and read it. For example, if I'm studying the book of Mark chapter one, I would encourage the listener to read chapter one at least 20 times. Um, my good friend, Robert Smith, he would often tell his seminary students to read chapter one 50 times. And the, the notion there, Lisa, is if you read it repeatedly, you may find that what you thought you knew, you really don't know. Mm -hmm. And so as you read it, as you sit with the text and read it, I also encourage 
uh, folks to have a pad and paper with uh, a pad and a pencil with them to jot down questions to, in other words, to interrogate the text. So jot down their questions, jot down their, um, their next steps. The next step then would be uh, the context. That's what C stands for. So after you sit with the text, C stands for um, context, the literary context and the cultural historical context. And the literary context is simply reading those passages that come after. For example, if I'm studying Mark 1, I'm going to read Mark 2 to see how Mark 2 may inform uh, my questions or my deliberations uh, on chapter 1. Um, and then I'm going to look at, look at the cultural historical context. And namely, I'm going to look at what was happening philosophically, what was happening politically, what was happening educationally, what was happening that can inform, what were the social customs of that day, what was happening um, uh, in the marketplace. I'm going to ask those type of questions to see, essentially, I, I want to transport myself back to that time to re-enter that space and time to understand how the first audience understood what the author was saying. And so that leads to the A in SCAR analysis. I'm going to uh, get out my microscope and analyze words, uh, sentence structure. I'm going to look at metaphors and similes and hyperbole. I'm going to look for the structure of the text, like a chiasmus is a inverted parallelism. I'm going to look for those. And then once I get to R in SCAR, if, if God's word is meant to be lived out, God's word addresses every human condition. And if I've done S, C, and A well, R is the redemptive remedy. What remedy does God offer for, for that passage? That passage will undoubtedly talk about a human condition and so the redemptive remedy is what remedy does God address or offer for that human condition? And I, I think I just ramble beyond uh, your question, but um, there you have it. No, that's good. Cause I think that's simple and easy for uh, the, the congregant to remember. Um, and I love it that you're putting it in terms that they can actually understand um, so much is so, uh, so lofty that, you know, people oftentimes can't grab it and then they feel intimidated, um, even so intimidated that they don't ask because most people that have been in church a long time, if they don't feel comfortable with interpreting scripture and knowing how to interpret, they're scared to ask because they feel like they should know. And so that shame keeps them still in the dark. Um, and so I, I, I appreciate that you wrote it with the just regular church goer in mind because yeah, that's, that that's a good point. That's a very good point because um, shame does have a way of of um, it's almost like a gag order on a person, particularly if someone's been in church all their life. Um, pride and shame would prevent that person from speaking up and saying, "I really don't know." That's good. Yeah. So yeah, I really appreciate that you wrote it with the lay person in mind for it for it, that that reason. When it comes to knowing the context, what resources are you pointing them to to get that information? Uh, another great question. So I often say SCAR is a disciplined stepwise approach to biblical interpretation. And the reason why I say discipline is our tendency is once you sit down with the Bible is reach for a Bible dictionary or a commentary before we've allowed the Bible to speak to us personally. Uh, too often we, we uh, cut corners to get to what the Bible is saying without the Bible speaking to us first. And who knows, we may discover that uh, what a commentary says or what a Bible dictionary says could, could in fact not be correct. So to answer your question, to find the cultural historical context, you reach for uh, maps, you look for good reputable commentaries, you search for good Bible dictionaries, 
Um, and if if the congregant is so inclined, he or she can do research by searching for articles uh, on the internet. But again, I caution, my only caution with internet sources is make sure you have, and I'm a stickler for, uh, when I teach hermeneutics, I'm, I'm a stickler for making sure you have printed resources and compare that to what you print off the internet because one of the dangers with, with the internet is uh, everyone's an expert and some of the resources on the internet are not uh, biblically sound. So to answer your question, Bible dictionaries, and I, I give several examples of good Bible dictionaries in the book. I give examples of commentaries, resources about maps, and another source is I often encourage congregants to have many translations of the Bible in their personal library. So if they love the King James Version, have an NIV, have an ESV, have a re, uh, Revised Standard Version as well, and compare compare those translations. The, the only word that's infallible is the original manuscripts. And we don't have those anymore. Uh, men translated, so we have these different versions. And, and so we want to make sure, uh, we don't want to give, we, we don't want to give translators the benefit of the doubt. We want to make sure for ourselves that those translations are, are indeed good and accurate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so uh, the translations like we like you listed, um, the King James Version, New King James Version, then you have NIV, then you have, um, you know, message and the difference between the a word for word, which it would be like a NASB, ESV, um, New Revised Standard, and then the paraphrase um, and then the um, Sentence is it sentence per the the breakdown in the between the um, King James or like a ESV or NASB or New Revised Standard would be more word for word, um, and then there's the paraphrase, which is like a message or NLT. But then there's the middle. Is it sentence per sentence? Yeah, there are three categories I mentioned in the uh, book. There's the formal equivalent, and that's pretty much, as you said, word for word, like the King James Revised Standard Version. There's also the dynamic equivalent. That's the NIV, uh, the Holman Christian St uh, Standard Bible. And then this paraphrase like uh, the Lifeway, um, Lifeway Bible, the Living Bible, and the Message. So basically our bibles translation bible translations fall under those three categories formal equivalent dynamic equivalents and paraphrase and your question about um the paraphrase takes a thought from a sentence in the original and translates it translates it if that if that's helpful mm -hmm. so the, the the paraphrase is mostly sentence by sentence mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for those who are really wrestling with understanding the text um, when they get to the application, because um, most, as one of my professors said, mo most error is done in application versus the, <laughs> the uh, just understanding the background of the text when this, the application, that's when it gets sticky for a lot of people. Uh, what are some tools that you've found helpful as you've been um, taking the text from uh, text to its application? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, I think your professor was right. Most of the heresy uh, occurs in the application. So one of the first principles I mentioned in the book is Always pray that the Holy Spirit is superintending or guiding your interpretation. I never rely on your own um, intellect or knowledge to interpret the Bible because we come to the Bible as a foreigner. Uh, many of the customs and uh, there's portions that were originally in Aramaic and, and Greek and Hebrew. So we come to the Bible as a foreigner. So we shouldn't 
presume that we can um, outdo the Holy Spirit. Uh, secondly, if I come up with a application that doesn't jive with history and uh, longstanding, if, if my interpretation or application doesn't square with what has been a, what's been um, developed from centuries of interpretation on, on, on a particular passage, then I need to really think about my application. In other words, if I come up with something that's so far afield from someone that's been doing this 100, 100 years ago, a thousand years ago, then I need to really question if, if my interpretation is correct and, and lastly, if my application is correct. And then the third safeguard is the body of Christ. I think too often we think, um, we think less of ourselves if we ask someone in the body of Christ, what do you think about this application? Uh, do you think this, this is right? I remember I was trying to, I was uh, interpreting Malachi chapter one, verses one through five, and I was having, I was having a hard time on the word hate, Esau loved, no, I'm sorry, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. It says that in Malachi chapter one, verses one through five. And I, so I eventually called my Old Testament professor and he illuminated for me what hate means in context. Hate in that particular passage means to not choose. Now, so, someone could read that passage and say, it's okay to hate people, but that's not what God had in mind. It was simply, much like when Jesus says, if you don't hate your father or mother, you cannot follow me. It's not a one of those emotional hates or vindictive hates. It's a, uh, Christ wants to be first place, so I need to love less mom and dad. And so uh, those three safeguards, the Holy Spirit, again, if my application is so far afield from what others have um, arrived at, then I need to really second guess my interpretation and my application. And then thirdly, another safeguard is just asking someone in the body of Christ has done this. So I would offer those three safeguards uh, when it comes to uh, going from um, years gone by, and that's the challenge. We want to re-enter that that time, and we want to, with interpretation, form a bridge to our contemporary context where we can apply it. So uh, I would offer those three uh, safeguards. Yeah, and I think that's incredibly helpful um, because, especially the last point, I think theology is, that's done in community is so helpful, and and many times it's not used as much. You know, studying done in isolation can be problematic when you get into difficult passages, and that community helps sharpen you. Um, and understanding that's kind of what scholarship is. You know, if you want to be, if you're aspiring to be a scholar, it's submitting your work to other people so they that's can right. critique it for that's community. Right. Um, peer review sources, peer review resources, like you you were saying, you know, don't get just random stuff off the internet. You talk about like peer review sources and how it's important for us to get articles that have been that other scholars have looked at to say, okay, this is accurate. Um, so I think you know we can have our own peer review uh, study. Uh, not necessarily with other scholars, but with people who've been in 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 um, in the word longer, uh, pastors and leaders, professors, to say, "Hey, critique my work. Be open to being wrong and be open to be challenged." I think it's helpful in doing doing um, interpretation of scripture. That's good. Uh, I agree, and that's again, that's why the body of Christ is so important. That's why I worry when um, folks will say. I really don't need church. I really don't need the body of Christ. Um, and I think those folks are maybe a few steps away from a slippery slope or heresy. That's mm -hmm. good. Yes.
Um, <clears throat> so uh, how can, what other things that you want to say about your book that you, we haven't already mentioned? Um, a couple of things. So with each letter of SCAR, I have a chapter for sitting with the text. I have a chapter for uh, context with plenty of examples. Um, I have a chapter for analysis and a chapter for redemptive remedy. And again, it's littered with many examples because when I taught hermeneutics to undergrads, I found the best way to explain concepts is to give plenty of examples. And so uh, the reader will see that um, I, I may explain something, then I give an example. And I think another benefit of this book is I give in chapter six and seven, I give two Old Testament scriptures. In chapter seven, I give two New Testament scriptures and I apply scar to those Old Testament passages and I, I apply scar to those two New Testament passages so they can see how it's done. And so uh, again, there's plenty of illustrations, uh, plenty of examples, and on top of that, uh, two examples on how SCAR is applied to two Old Testament passages and how SCAR is applied to two New Testament passages. That's helpful. How can people get your, your book, Dr. Bobo? Well, um, I hate to make Amazon richer, but um, <laughs> <laughs> they can uh, purchase this book off of Amazon or they can go straight to the publisher. The publisher is WIF in stock, uh, W-I-P-H stock, S-T-O-C-K, with in stock, or they can buy directly off of Amazon. Awesome, well, thank you so much for taking time with us. Do, um, before we go, how can people get connected to you on social media? Well, I have a Twitter handle and I need to look it up because I'm not as nimble with social media as, as you are probably, Miss Lisa. <laughs> I'm on Facebook. Um, they can just Google my name or search my name on Facebook, but Twitter, my handle, if that's the proper. Yeah, handle. that's right. Okay, let me pull it up here. Twitter uh, at Luke Bobo. Luke Bobo is a way to contact me via Twitter and just do a search of my name on Facebook. Awesome. Before we go, there was one question that just popped in my mind that I forgot to ask you. When okay. you talk about teaching um, adults um, versus teaching um, teaching children, uh, it seems that sometimes we forget like when when people are in school that there's, you know, different strategies to teach different folk. Uh, but when we get to adulthood in church, uh, we only use one strategy uh, to teaching from the pulpit. And then sometimes we wonder why people aren't learning. Uh, from your studies, what are some helpful strategies for teaching adults uh, the, the Old Testament? OK, so uh, a good final question. I would say a couple of things. Number one, there is overlap between pedagogy and andragogy. In other words, there's overlap for teaching kids and adults. For example, when I used to teach adults, I would bring in, for example, if I were teaching on the parable about the mustard seed, I actually brought in mustard seed. And so uh, as a little kid, you remember as a kid, you did show and tell. So I brought in the show and tell item for adults so they can get a visual of how small a mustard seed was or is. So uh, for any teachers listening, just keep in mind that some of the same things we did as a kid, for example, I, I took one of my classes, hermeneutics classes to a museum. It was an archeology span museum and they were able to see actual artifacts of a lamp, for example, or jewelry. So um, keep in mind that adults, we, we're, adults are really grown up kids in many ways. So, so while there's some similarities between teaching kids and adults, 
One major difference in teaching adults is this. Adults want to know how this can be put into action right away. And so when teaching adults, uh, I found that I had to apply the scriptures. I had to give examples what this looks like in your workplace or in your home or in your neighborhood. So while some principles are the same, some methods are the same in teaching kids and adults like field trips and and uh, come and see or show and tell. One major difference in teaching adults is they want to know how this applies. And, and the second thing that teachers need to keep in mind when teaching adults, and this just occurred to me, kids don't bring any life experience to the table, but adults do bring life experience to the table. So it's not unusual to find in my classrooms I try to pull things out of adults to get them to discuss. Because one of the things I find that helps critical thinking is for people to think out loud or to speak out loud. And as they hear themselves talking, they may say, you know, that sounds right. Or maybe I need to rethink what I just said, or maybe I need to rethink how I think about this passage. So while uh, some methods are the same or there's similar methods you can use for pedagogy and andragogy, teaching kids and teaching adults, there's two major differences. One, uh, adults want to know how this applies. And two, adults bring life experiences to the table that kids don't, just don't have. Mm -hmm. That's good. I love what you said when you said that with, with one of the aids to critical thinking is to thinking out loud. And I think when we are thinking about church oftentimes a bible study or there's not spaces for interaction most of the time so there's not critical thought because there's no time to think out loud mm -hmm. um and so if we want to engage adults or we want them to think deeply or deeper about scripture then maybe we should create spaces where they can respond in a way where they can critically engage what's being said instead of just it just being uh a lecture in which most of the time, if if I would think back to my seminary days, college days, it was me interacting with the professor talking in which I really learned. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't when I was taught that it was when I there was communication um, back and forth. So if we want people to think critically, I think that's really something that, you know, you brought out that I think is very helpful. Yeah, perhaps churches should do a a smaller scale, courageous conversations like you did in Chicago. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> we'll have one next year again, and uh, we'll have hopefully have some smaller ones throughout the year. But uh, definitely, I think. Who's it, that, whose idea was that, by the way? Courageous conversations. Yeah. That was mine. Oh, it's uh, and once I got on that stage and uh, we started talking, I could see why it was called Courageous Conversations. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bobo. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. And um, I hope people will get your book. Uh, just like, I'm very encouraged to see um, books on hermeneutics and um, coming from, and just theological books in general, theology books in general, coming from African-Americans. And one of the things that I'm passionate about is promoting black scholars. Uh, so that's why all the scholars that create conversations were black, because that's something I want to see highlighted. And, and um, so I'm thankful for your work. Um, and I appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, all the best to you at Jew3. And that's that's one of my favorite passages to contend for the faith. So uh, you have, you certainly have a fan here. <laughs> Thank you.